All right. Uh, good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to ECE's Stories of Success webinar. Um, my name, for those of you that haven't seen me before, is Milan Kulkarni. I'm the Associate Head of Teaching and Instruction, in, uh, sorry, Teaching and Learning in ECE, uh, and I also teach compilers and programming languages. Um, today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest, uh, Nikhil Bogo. He is uh, a graduate of Purdue. He got his uh, bachelor's in computer engineering back in 2003. Um, and he's worked at a company you've definitely heard of, Apple. If you've ever used uh, an Apple iPhone and used their cameras, you have almost certainly interacted with some technology that he has had a hand in. Um, but for the last several years, he's actually been working in a, a sort of different space. He's been working in the cooking space, uh, where he uh, is the CTO of a company called June that makes a smart oven that honestly I have wanted for a really long time. So Nikhil hooked me up with a discount code. I'm really happy about that. Um, and uh, it's an amazing device that kind of automates a lot of the cooking process for you and, and brings together a lot of different technologies. And so Nikhil has had a tremendous amount of experience both on the design side of the world, the engineering side of the world and the leadership side of the world uh, since he left Purdue in 2003. Uh, in fact, uh, June was recently acquired by Weber. So if you have a Weber grill, you might be seeing some of their technology uh, come your way uh, in the near future. So it gives me great pleasure to, to have Nikhil join us. Uh, your host today is going to be Jackie Malater uh, from HKN. She's going to be fielding questions, asking some questions of her own. And I am really excited to hear from Nikhil, and I think uh, you guys will all enjoy this. So Nikhil, welcome. And Jackie, take it away. Thank you, Malint. Hey, Jackie. Um, so let's just start off with a lead off. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what it's like being asked to come back to Purdue as a success story uh, for our students to learn from. Um, <clears throat> hi everyone, my name's Nikhil, Nikhil Bogle. Um, like Malin said, I was here and I graduated in 2003 in CE. Um, after that, I, my first job was at Motorola, not that far from West Lafayette in Chicago. And the reason I joined Motorola was I loved gadgets. I liked the idea of working on something that I could show to my grandma and say, this is what I worked on. One of the other opportunities I had back then was to work at Microsoft. And I just didn't feel like Microsoft Office would be something I could show to my parents or my grandma and say, this is interesting. I love gadgets. I love anything which is physical and tactile. Um, after Moat, I was there for about four years. I got a chance to work on Moto Razor. Um, and after that, Apple announced their iPhone in early 2007, and they recruited me out right after that to work um, in Cupertino. Um, I have the privilege of being the first camera software engineer at Apple. So I got to work on the camera system on iPhone 1 through 5, your iPads, iPod touches and features like FaceTime, instant shutter, tap to focus, lock screen camera, uh, panorama, like a bunch of stuff that a billion and a half people use every day. Um, that was a great experience to be there. Um, I was at Apple for about five years and then the startup bug bit me and I decided it was time to go try something on my own um, with one of my friends who had helped write the Apple camera app, uh, had moved to a startup and I followed him, joined there as an iOS developer. Um, I was there for about a year and a half and then the founder bug bit me, which is I wanted to go start my own company. And then again, with a friend of mine, we started a new company called June. The, the vision for June was to build an operating system for the home. I really enjoyed my OS class at Purdue and I wanted to make an OS for the home. And we needed a, a host to try the OS on. And we were both turning 30, we were both uh, into cooking or we had gotten into cooking lately. And we felt kitchen was a blue ocean space and kitchen with operating systems and electronics would be an interesting mix to try out. So we tried that out. And that's how the June oven was born. Um, and that was seven, eight years ago. We just got acquired early this year in Jan by Weber. We helped Weber with the first smart grill, which was launched in 2020. And right, right now I run all of software and hardware development for all the smart grills at Weber. So you have 
quite the resume. And that is incredible to see how you've um, touched all these products that really impact people's lives every day. So um, that's incredible. Um, so let's go ahead and start and talk about your uh, time here at Purdue, and then we'll go on to talk about your career. So my first question about Purdue are, why Purdue? So what are some of the factors that made you choose Purdue for college? Well, I wish I, have a, I had an interesting answer for this one. It was pretty straightforward. I looked at, I looked at the rankings. Um, what was it? World, like a world news? Like whatever, whatever the ranking system was back then. I looked at the top EE rankings um, and I made a second column in Excel, which was tuition and cost of living. Purdue was the best bang for the buck. Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good reason. I know that's a reason why a lot of people come to Purdue. It's a great value. Yeah. Um, so uh, what are one of your most ab or absolute favorite memories from Purdue? Oh, man. Um, see, the thing with memories is you have no control over them. Like whatever stays, stays. Um, mm -hmm. You can't just push it in. Um, one of my earliest memories at Purdue was during orientation, which was, we had just flown in. I had flown in from India, so New Delhi. Um, the international student body had put me up in some temporary housing, and it was orientation day the next morning. I hadn't eaten for like 24 hours. Um, so I step out, there's a break, and there's a hot dog stand. That was the best hot dog of my life, um, right outside near the fountain. Um, that's one of my earliest, but it's just a memory that stays. Um, I think one of my favorite memories is actually, there's two of them. One is doing a fountain run. Um, yes. It was such a rush to do that. I don't know if you guys still do it, but- um, we, we sure do still do those. <laughs> and it was a cold evening and it was still fun to do it. Um, one of my absolute favorite memories is I worked, um, on a project called E-Stadium. So this was at ross um, Professor Rosenberg who used to teach networking. She had set up a partnership with Microsoft and we were building a social network. Like this is, by the way, this is like 2001, 2002. Social network wasn't a thing, but we were building a social network for the stadium. And Microsoft had given us, I think 200 of these compact PDAs that would run on, that would just get on the Wi-Fi. So between I, ITAP, the IT department, who were mm -hmm. setting up like all these Cisco access points up at the stadium and Microsoft, we had Wi-Fi connected PDAs for anyone who wanted them at game day. So we built the software to run on it that let you look at scores, bios, concession stands, stuff like that, and chat with other people who were in the stadium. But my favorite memory is there was a problem with one of the access points and I followed uh, one of the ITAP guys to like, I think the roof or something. And it was a live game that was going on that I get caught to watch from like one of the highest points at Ross 8. Um, that was, that was that's unforgettable. That is an incredible experience. And it's, it's really amazing that you were doing all of that you know, before social media was really, had really taken off. I think that's pretty incredible. Um, so moving on, um, what's your favorite Purdue tradition? I guess it's gotta be the fountain run, um, followed by, I don't know, is it kosher to say Harry's? Like, is Harry's still there? Yes, Harry's is still there yeah. also. <laughs> Did you, did you do that during um, orientation or did you just do it with some friends? Well, the fountain run I think was done when, so I, I lived at Cary, um, mm -hmm. Cary Court. So I think it was, a maybe our RA organized it and got all the kids out and like we're, we're going running into the fountain. Um, Harry's was like much later. I had to be 21 to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that, um, you know, a lot of the freshmen do the fountain run, so I don't know if they go to Harry's, but it is still <laughs> alive and well. <laughs> yep. um, so what was your favorite place to study on campus while you were at Purdue and why? I think there's a couple. Um, 
my favorite I would say I spent so much time there used to be a sun solaris lab in the ECE building when you come in from the parking lot and so when you walk in on the right side there's this massive there used to be this massive computer lab which had these sun systems these sun workstations to do uh, like VHDL or like there were just Linux or Unix based systems and that, uh, and that lab was always dark. I don't know why it was that way, but it was just dark. That was the perfect place to go, take a book, sit down, get a computer, do your coding and read something because everyone was quiet. Everyone was there, heads down. There was no Facebook, there was no distractions. The web was not that interesting. There was no online shopping and it was a, Unix machine. So it ran some old school Netscape thing on it. So all the distractions were taken away and then all they had to do was work. So I, I loved doing that. That sounds really nice. I think um, I may be wrong, but I think that we ended up building a collaboration space where that lab was. Um, so if you ever make it back on campus, you can check that out. <laughs> I absolutely will. Um, so um, I think that I might know the answer to this already, but what was your favorite class at Purdue um, and why? My favorite class? Well, there was, there was a couple. Um, and part of me wishes I was there for, like our undergrad program was longer because I really wanted to take more classes. Like four mm -hmm. years has never felt enough. Um, but if I had to pick one, it's senior design. It's like 462. Um, EE 462. I think it was a senior design class. Um, and the reason it was my favorite is it's a combination of everything you've learned in the last couple of years, and mm -hmm. you get to put it together in your own way. Like it's an assignment which is open ended, you get to pick your own project that you design, and it pushes you to be a team player because it's not just you who has to do the work, you have to work with the team, you have to understand the strengths and weaknesses of each one of your uh, teammates and friends and see how you work together to get something that works that has to be demoed in front of class. So that, 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 that class was amazing. So what did you make for your senior design project? Oh, um, so we made a, so I love music uh, and I don't play any music. I have no talent for that, but I love listening to music. Um, we made a Bluetooth transmitter for iPods. So the idea was, um, or at least the vision was that your home will have a bunch of these Bluetooth speakers, your car will have a Bluetooth speaker someday. Um, it, it wasn't a thing back then. Bluetooth was meant to be for like lightweight data connections for cell phones. Like music hadn't really caught on for Bluetooth headsets or Bluetooth speakers. Remember this is 2002 maybe three. Um, we made a transmitter that was battery powered, uh, had an aux jack, would plug into an iPod. And if you were playing music in your car, it would obviously come on the speakers. And if you walked away and got into your home, it would pick up on your home speakers, the same iPod. Um, and that, that was a complicated, uh, but a really fun project for us to do. Yeah, that's really impressive. <laughs> um... Yeah, that's amazing um, and really cool. <laughs> so um, can you tell me, um, did you have like a mentor or a professor who really inspired you um, at Purdue and how did that shape your career path? Um, I actually think about this quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> Before Purdue, the idea of mentors just wasn't present in my life. It just wasn't a thing. Um, and when I think about it, I did have implicit mentors in my life, like my grandma, my parents, a couple of teachers, a couple of sort of elders in our community. But once you leave home, once you're done with like under the umbrella of your parents and you go to university, you're not living with them anymore. Like those bonds start to sort of weaken up and you're about, you're in this transition between home, college, university, and then work. It's actually, it's been a good lesson to actively seek out mentors. And one of my 
favorite people at Purdue was Professor Rosenberg. I, I, I don't think she's there anymore. She's at, uh, she's at Calgary, I think. Um, but she was my networking, my networking class. Uh, she used to teach networking. And somehow we struck up a conversation which eventually turned into a mentor-mentee relationship. And I ended up doing research for her. The East Stadium project was something that she was working on. And that absolutely changed my life. So for anyone who here does not have or hasn't spent time and energy looking at or analyzing your, your own situation when it comes to mentors, I highly, highly recommend find someone because your mentor has traveled the road you're about to travel and it just makes it a lot easier for them to give you feedback and tell you the gotchas or where to focus and how to um, how to even think about the future. As when you're, when you're in your undergrad, you're just so fresh out of high school and the world ahead of you is so different. You do need someone to at least tell you how to think if nothing else. And, and that's what she did. Um, she was an amazing guide. Um, she's probably the reason I was able to even get a job after school because we had just seen the dot-com crash, tech was down, engineering was down, and it was just hard to find jobs back then. But, but it was Professor Rosenberg. I, I definitely agree with you. I think mentorship is really important. So um, I just want to follow up. Do you have any advice on how to find a mentor? Because I know it's not always easy to just, you know, walk up to someone and say like, hey, can you be my mentor? So do you have any, um, I guess, advice for our students here? Well, <clears throat> I think the first thing is it starts with you realizing and wanting it for the right reasons. Um, the, okay, the way I sort of process this is it's a, it's a feeling that comes from within where you feel the need for guidance um, in your life and you know you don't have all the answers and you don't know who to ask. So at that point, look around in your immediate circle and it could be professors, friends, parents of friends, um, anyone who's been down the path you might go down on. So and then have a conversation with them. And like you said, it, it's awkward, but it's just worth, it's like popping the question. You just have to do it. Um, and a no is a fine answer and you just try your next one, but you have to get out of your comfort zone. Um, and most people who get asked to be mentors, they actually find it, I've been asked many times and they find it quite rewarding. Um, you might feel like they're so busy and it's gonna be a waste of time for them, but that's not the case. Um, as you get older and you have more experience, there is this innate human urge to share what you've learned with others. So it, it, it's fulfilling for both sides. Um, so don't, don't be scared, just go ask someone. Uh, that, well, that's an excellent perspective that, you know, since you're a mentor to people now that you find it fulfilling, that's a great thing to hear. Um, so I'm gonna move on from the Purdue stuff. Um, and I just want to say, those who are here listening, if you have any questions or anything, you can type them in the question and answer window, and we'll get to those at the end. Um, but on to your career. Um, what's one thing that you know now that you wish you had known when you were in college? <clears throat> well, there's actually maybe a couple of things. That's fine. You can say uh, a couple things too. Well, one of the important things I've learned over the years is so, so two things, I guess. I'll focus on just two. One is so I'm an introverted person. That's just how I was born. I, that doesn't mean I don't like people, it just means um, to be able to recharge, I need my own space. Um, and the other thing is, before I speak, I need to think in my mind before the words come out. Now, on the other hand, extroverted folks tend to think while speaking, and they get energy from being around a bunch of people. Um, so that's how I sort of define introverted and extroverted. Now, one of the downsides of being born introvert, introverted thinker, is 
you tend to be afraid of public speaking or talking to a larger crowd. You're great at like one-on-one -on -one conversations, but you hesitate or find it uncomfortable to do it with a group. And that is something, it's, it's one of those necessary things that you need to be successful um, in life or make an impact, forget success, uh, just to make an impact um, with your community, with your company, with your friends and family is the ability to communicate clearly to a larger group of people. So I wish um, it's something I had to learn myself, um, especially after I started my own company, just I was forced into it, but I avoided it. Um, and I wish I had like consciously gotten out of my comfort zone early in my life to get more comfortable with it. Um, well, the other thing, I think this is the big one is I grew up in a pretty risk averse sort of mindset. Uh, risk was something that was precursor to failure. Like that's, that's a lot of folks think that we should not take a risk because we would lose money or not get a job or the career is not gonna work out or whatever, like something negative. Um, it took me some time to realize the fact that risk can be seen, and this is a mindset change, that risk is a catalyst for learning and change. You try something new, you fail, you learn something, but if you succeed, they're good for you. You've tried something new. So I, I think I should have taken more risks uh, back at, like, at an early age um, and also pushed myself to, you know, like, learn communication skills with a larger audience. Um, I just would like to follow up on your first half. Um, what did you find were like the best ways to learn how to be a better uh, speaker despite being introverted? Because I'm, I'm curious to know as well, I'm an introverted person also. Um, I think this is the same answer as how do you find a mentor? You just gotta do it. Um, and in some ways, it, both of these tie to risk, which is, if your mentor says no, you're taking a risk, but if your mentor says yes, good for you. Um, and the same with putting yourself in uncomfortable situations, if it, you have a large group of people and you have to communicate an idea, then you're taking a risk that it might not work, but it usually is not a problem. Like you have to realize people are quite tolerant of people. <laughs> um, so you just have to take the risk of trying it out um, and get comfortable with it. Great. And thanks for that advice. Um, so, you know, as someone who probably um, manages and oversees a lot of people, um, I'm sure that COVID has kind of changed the way things work in a sense. So yeah. um, what advice would you offer to students who are nearing graduation as they transition to the post-COVID world? Yeah, so in our case, I mean, COVID, the start, I, I remember March 11th, like very vividly, that's when we went into shutdown. Um, we used to have it, our office, the June offices were in downtown San Francisco. If anyone's been, it's near the ferry building, near the water, beautiful. Um, COVID comes and we realize we have to shut down. At first we thought this was a two week thing and we'll be back, maybe a three week thing and we'll be back, but clearly never happened. So we as a company made a conscious decision to go remote. Uh, which is there was no point in paying our expensive downtown San Francisco lease while it was just sitting empty. So we let our lease elapse um, and we just went remote as a company. So the whole company, every team was working from home. Now, in terms of that's a crisis, but there's an opportunity in here. And the opportunity is we started hiring more remote people than folks in San Francisco. Like so the Bay Area has a lot of tech talent and engineering talent, but that's limited. Um, so now because of remote, we were able to get folks in North Carolina, Chicago, Canada, Brazil. So our team now is about 25% remote and there's folks from everywhere. And what does that mean for new grads? Um, it, it means you have an opportunity to work for world-class companies probably across the world because a lot of companies are remote friendly now than they were in the past. So I would encourage 
be open to the idea of working remote. Um, it might be it, it is going to be a first job, but don't don't stay within the geographic region anymore. Uh, the search for engineering talent is it's it's a very very competitive market right now, and remote is definitely a secular trend that we see growing over the next couple of years. Great. And that, yeah, that's an excellent perspective from, you know, someone who's very high up in a company. This is, that's a decision that you had to make. So I'm great to hear your perspective on that. Um, so over the course of your career, you have supervised and directly participated in the launch of several different revolutionary products. Um, I remember when the Razor, everybody wanted one. So that's, <laughs> that's really cool. Um, what would you say, though, are some of the most memorable products that you have been associated with? Um, and which ones have played the biggest role in defining your approach to engineering? Well, it's lucky enough to have one interesting product that you worked, in, worked on in your career. Um, I've had the luxury or the good fortune to do a couple of them. So Moto Razor was one. Um, the first iPhone and actually the first couple of iPhones, iPads, uh, they were all in that bucket. Um, in terms of the sheer impact, um, I would say the iPhone has changed how we live um, for the most part. It kicked off, it pushed Google to do Android um, and it brought true computing to a small screen that you would carry with you everywhere. Um, Apple is an amazingly well-managed company. And the best way to describe Apple is it's a startup that is infinitely funded and can turn on a dime. And in, in a lot of ways, seeing product development within from app within Apple, especially so uh, the ECE folks will understand what I'm talking about here. So I sat at the middleware layer. So the apps or the UI was above me and the hardware firmware was below me. And that is such a great vantage point to be in a company which is completely vertically integrated. So Apple would do their own silicon all the way to their own services in the cloud. Of course, their own hardware and everything in the middle. So that vantage point um, gave me a, a view into how silicon was designed and how the roadmaps were planned out um, and what the future of devices looked like within the Apple ecosystem. And that vantage point, that perspective has probably shaped how I think about software, hardware, electronics and consumer experience development um, today. Awesome. Um, well, to segue off of that, um, you're also working on cutting edge technology now. Um, so what are some of the most revolutionary technologies you're interacting with today that you can share with us? Um, and how do you think that'll change and shape the world tomorrow? Well, I think this is probably an obvious answer. It's AI, machine learning. Um, we all live in a world where our world is shaped by algorithms. The, the news articles you see, the posts that you see on social media or your favorite news app, it's all the algorithm. <laughs> um, everything that Amazon recommends you buy or try out or what other people bought, it's an algorithm. Anything on YouTube, anything on Netflix, it's an algorithm. Um, it, someday cars will be completely or mostly autonomous and that will be an algorithm. So in terms of sheer impact of a technology, it's the nexus of edge computing plus infinitely large data sets on images of the real world plus machine learning applied on top. I, I feel that is in the next year, it's gonna, in the next 10 years, it will change how we, it's, it, it already has, but it will profoundly change how we view the world, interact with others, and how we do work. Um, so for example, for folks who don't know, the June oven has a camera built in. Um, there's a camera that's looking down in the oven at all the food that's coming in and being cooked. The camera has 
edge AI capabilities, which means it's able to process the image and make recommendations without hitting the cloud. And the way we use that to make the user experience better is you put food in, um, let's say something simple as it's Saturday morning and you're making bacon um, for the family. You take a pan, put seven strips of bacon, put it in, the camera sees that there's bacon in it. One, it knows there's bacon. Second, it knows how many um, strips of bacon there are, so seven. Third, it knows how you usually cook your bacon, which is crispy. Um, it also remembers what kind of bacon do you usually buy. It might be butcher cut or thin or thick. And it will just prompt you and say, do you want me to cook it? And that's it. Um, you get a push notification when the cooking is done and you don't have to mess around with a stovetop, a pan, um, knowing how long to cook it for or setting your stove to medium, medium high. Like it just takes over the whole process and does it for you. Now imagine 10 years from now, technologies like these will be sort of commonplace around us and they will change how we live our lives in a very profound way. That is, um, I, I just wanna follow up on that. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of different, um, I guess, disciplines in um, ECE. So do you think it's valuable even if, you know, okay, maybe machine learning is not your thing. Do you think it's valuable to at least learn a little bit about it? Maybe take a class? I, I never say no to learning, um, <laughs> but yes. Um, <clears throat> And you know, it's in, in some ways, um, education has evolved over the last 10 years as well. Um, there's a ton of courses open on from MIT and Coursera that even if you don't have the time or the funds to take a particular class, it's worth taking an online class and just learning about it. I, I honestly feel that the ability to code or write some kind of software will be as commonplace or as normal as the ability to do math. I, I, I kind of think about ability to interact with software and shape it to do what you want to do is just a skill that will be needed forever and ever. So even if you're an EE major um, and you really don't have to take operating systems or any of these CE or CS type classes, it's worth pushing yourself to try some of that. Well, that's an excellent point. There's a lot of um, free or very inexpensive ways to learn programming and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so I want to shift over to um, your June, which seems to be um, your latest uh, project and company. Um, so tell us a little bit about June. Um, and then also, I'm curious to know how did June begin, right? Because you had the founder bug. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um... So the year is 2013. Um, one of my good friends at the startup I was working at at that time, that, that startup was called PATH, P-A-T-H. It was a social network um, founded by <clears throat> an ex-Facebook exec and a designer and a guy called Sean Fanning. He was the founder for Napster. I don't know if anyone remembers stealing music um, Nap Napster was the thing to do. Um, so these guys had this vision of making a mobile first, so iOS first social network. Facebook back then was a desktop only thing and the web version on mobile wasn't very good. So anyway, so that, that was my startup bug that I tried. And there I met my co-founder, uh, Matt, Matt Van Horn, and we clicked together really well. And we are complete complementary personalities. Um, like I said, I am introverted, he's extroverted. And it's good to have a partner who is sort of the opposite of you because your strengths are their weaknesses and vice versa. And it works really well. So we, we clicked and we at some point decided we should start a company. And at some point, the idea of an operating system for the home was brewing in my mind. And at the same time, we were both starting to cook more at home. And one thing led to another. And 
we were trying to work on our startup ideas after work, but we ended up cooking dinner for us instead. And, and that was kind of taking the idea of making an operating system that would control the home to, hey, the kitchen really hasn't had any innovation for the last 40 years. Why does this look the same? This is gonna change, right? We should do it. So it was the combination of both that led to the idea of June. Um, some people asked me, how did the name came about? Like, why is it called June? Um, we were basically sitting on GoDaddy and looking for domain names and see which ones would open. And we had like all sorts of crazy names, like Blue Lake, Bezel, Blue, Zen, like nonsense names. Um, and then we started looking at, okay, you know what? This is not working out. We should look at commonly used English names that everyone can understand. Um, so we went through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, like these are not good sounding names. Like no one's gonna buy our products if they're called Thursday. Um, so then we started looking at month names, Jan, Feb, March, April, May. May was like, okay, that's kind of okay. It's a nice sounding name. Um, and then we came to June and june.com was available. <laughs> So that was our first uh, sign that um, this might be interesting. And then we went to July, not interesting, August. August was taken as a smart lock company called August. And then anyway, we just nodded on June. June to us reminded of um, late spring, early summer, blue skies, green grass, barbecues, eating out, just general positive feeling. So we just picked the name and that was it. So the company was formed after like a week of sitting on GoDaddy, picking a name, having an idea. And November 2013, we quit our jobs. We had no paychecks, um, sat on the couch and started working on the company. So, th so, that's, so that's how June began. Well, um, that's, it's great to see how, you know, you took a risk like you were telling us is really important. And there you go, you have this amazing company that recently got acquired. So um, yeah, so I, Jackie, I, so one thing to add is <clears throat> um, it's that risk at that time felt so big, so big um, that the idea of not having a job, starting a company and hopefully someday raising funds to pay yourself and pay employees. Um, but the idea, and I encourage the audience to think about this, was I by that time, I felt comfortable enough in my engineering skills, which was, you know what, I will try this out. If this doesn't work, I can always get a job as a software engineer. Mm -hmm. So it didn't, it, it took a lot of courage to do it at that time. But the rationale was, you know, worst case doesn't, if it doesn't work out, back to Pat or back to Apple. Um, yeah, kind of and I think that's an excellent point. I think that's a very smart and calculated risk you took. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to go out here and start June. Like, you really thought about it. Um, and so I, I really respect that. And I think that's an excellent point to make. Um, so being um, someone who founds a startup, um, it's not easy. So can you describe one of the biggest challenges that you faced either in June or in your career? And how did you overcome this challenge? I would say one of the hardest things to do was our first fundraise. Like raising our first round of funding was, was immensely hard because it's two guys with a vision to make an appliance company and not just any appliance company but a smart appliance company um, and hardware is quite expensive it's capital intensive to fundraise um, and we weren't just trying to do any old hardware we're trying to do ai on the edge um, current generation machine learning technologies. Um, so like neural nets wasn't as evolved as it's today, it wasn't accessible. So, and again, this is 2013, um, current day machine learning was still nascent. Uh, there wasn't a lot of hardware that would do this. 
So anyway, a lot of question marks around the feasibility of the company and the viability of uh, the company itself. So raising our first round was quite a challenge. Um, the way we navigated that was we figured if there's a team in place and the team is talented, that takes a lot of the risk away around being able to build something. So we went about hiring a bunch of people. We didn't have any money, but we still tried our best to convince folks to come work with us for no money, but just equity, which is we would give them, well, you get this tiny percentage of the company, you get to be owners, but we can't pay you until we raise it out. So the way we kind of overcame our first big challenge, our first crisis was we had a good team in place, an excellent team in place. Um, we had our first connections built with um, contract manufacturers in China um, through friends and friends and friends. And we checked a couple of boxes that gave us the confidence that we would be able to build this and ship this product. And hopefully that confidence would convey over to our investors, our future investors to put money in. Um, and, and it took six months of work, um, but it worked out. We were able to raise around kind of almost six months into our founding. Um, and th that was good. It was seven, seven million, I think, for our first round. So it worked out. But it was hard, <laughs> very, very hard. It does, it does sound very hard, especially, you know, as you said, you, those public speaking skills and, you know, trying to convince people was definitely probably uh, took a toll, but you, you grew through it. So that's, that's great. Um, so during your career, you've had the opportunity uh, to work at the leadership level for several well-known companies. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how your Purdue ECE degree allowed you to advance in these positions? You know, I, I, I say this quite often to a lot of people. There is every course I've taken at Purdue plays a role in how I think today, even down to arts appreciation. I'm sure someone has taken arts appreciation 156 or whatever, just to get an easy A. But what I can tell you is everything I did at Purdue somehow magically plays a role in everything I do today. Um, and I think we should never discount um, knowledge. Um, Purdue is a great institution and every course you take and including things like Econ 101, it changes how you think about the world because you know more about the world by virtue of learning. Um, I think there's, there's no other way to put it, but everything I've learned in my whole life somehow plays a role in all the decisions, uh, all the guidance or uh, everything I do at any given time. Because the, the whole world is so interconnected. It's very hard to peel apart uh, it's just so hard to like silo um, knowledge or silo your role because it's just such an interconnected world. Well, and to, to follow up on that, um, how do you view the importance of lifelong learning? You know, you, you're out of school, but I'm yeah. sure that you probably learn something new every day. So can you tell us a little bit about how that plays a role in your life? Well, I, I still use Coursera. I still take courses online. Um, um, see, the reality is change is constant and learning has to keep up with the change because let's take one example. Machine learning wasn't a thing when I was at Purdue, um, it's, but it's such a big deal right now. And it's the reason June was able to do what it intended to do, which is make cooking easier for everyone. So you don't have to learn how to cook. The machine does it for you. Um, I think I feel lifelong learning is, it requires, it's like gardening, it requires intent, you have to go do the work, um, but it does pay off. Um, and, but you have to consciously put investment, time, effort into it. Um, so I, I wanna leave some time for the students to ask questions. So I do have one more really important question. I was told it's the most important question of the night. Um, 
how do you choose to define success? Oh, <clears throat> very loaded question. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, and, and I think I'll, I'll try and answer it in a way that it is of value to folks in that undergrad. Um, if you, let's draw a Venn diagram. Imagine you have a circle which has all your strengths in it, like stuff that you're good at. Um, then you have another circle, which is your passion, which is stuff you really enjoy doing. For example, I enjoy listening to music. I wish I could play music, but I suck at the piano, right? So no intersection here. Then you look at Another circle, which is your weaknesses, stuff you're not good at, like nature did not give these things to you, um, or you have to work really hard to get something done. I feel success is when you, when you are able to overlap your passion and your strengths. Um, so ability to work or spend your time day to day where your passion and your strengths overlap um, and your weaknesses are made just neutral. They don't drag you down, but they're just acceptable. So get a, get, a, get a passing grade or a C in your weaknesses, get an A plus in your strengths, and make sure your strengths and your passions overlap. So I feel folks who are able to do that or craft their life in a way that overlap works, that's how I think about success. I have never heard an answer like that, um, but I think that's a really beautiful answer to the question. Exactly. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and um, we seem to have five questions in the chat. So um, I'll start with the uh, oldest one. So John asked, when starting a company, what should the founders spend most of their time on? It's a, it's a very good question with, but it doesn't have a good answer. <laughs> um, <clears throat> In some ways, you have to spend time on everything because there's no one else doing that work, right? Um, one of the things that founders usually don't spend a, spend a lot of time on early on is the business model and how will you ever make money? Um, but some people might focus there, but they might miss out on the product experience or the technology or the feasibility or the scaling aspect of the company. Uh, in some ways, I think to wrap this up, the answer is probably at some point you will touch every aspect of the company. You have to figure out which one's the most important um, given let's say a six month horizon. For example, when we did June, the first six months were all focused on what do we need to do to raise a round? And then it was, what do we need to do to ship a product? Um, so your priorities change over time. So having a clear view into what's the most important thing right now, spend time on that, and then move on to your focus to the next batch. Okay, and then Runlin asked, um, hello, Nikhil. What do you think that the most important features or abilities that companies like Apple would focus on when we apply for a job or internship? There's a, so there was a learning that I had um, in this aspect. I think the first one was your grades do matter, but they do matter, but above a certain level, they don't matter as much. I think what really matters is the ability uh, to realize that the person you're talking to, um, when you do get a, on a conversation with someone is another human being and being able to forge a relationship as quickly as possible to make a connection um, and be memorable and have a clear idea around what you want to do and how you fit into the grand scheme of things for that company. So people are looking for not just pure talent, but folks who can communicate well and take initiative um, and the ability to just build a rapport as soon as possible. So 
uh, and I think this plays out at job fairs, but also like phone screenings and like online or phone interviews as well. And definitely in on sites where the moment you are able to work with them as a human being, that's the foundation for everything else to sit on top of. Okay. Um, and then an anonymous person asked, would you recommend for us as students to specialize in a special field or should we take classes from various fields to gain broader knowledge? I am a sucker for knowledge. Um, and I would, if, if I wish I could just study my whole life, um, I think going back to the framework of your strengths, passion, and weaknesses, um, your, your time at Purdue is probably best spent trying to understand yourself first, which is what is it that you like to do? What is that makes you happy? And what is it that you're able to do well? So from that perspective, taking a broad selection of classes helps you figure out that was enjoyable, that was fun, I was good at that, and that one I was good at, but I also enjoyed it. Um, so from that perspective, I would recommend take a broad set of classes, figure out what makes sense. Um, and in some ways, the classes you take do help you with your job, but don't discount the fact that most of the learning that will happen will be at the job rather than in school. Um, Purdue does an excellent job of putting out a formal framework to understand the various areas of expertise that you need to know to be able to do something. For example, I was talking to Professor Millen and I didn't take compilers, um, but I took OS instead of compilers. And in some ways that shaped my future, <laughs> but I also found out that I, enjoyed OSs and I was good at them. And it's just something you just have to discover for yourself. Um, so probably going wide and then narrowing down is probably a good idea. If you've implemented the oven camera system or a similar system that you mentioned, well, you have implemented it. Have you had any performance issues with vision and edge computing on a device that must fit in an appliance? So, um, so in 2013, so everyone has here heard of NVIDIA. So NVIDIA is one of their first processors that had, so NVIDIA came up with this technology called CUDA. So CUDA helps you run, it leverages multiple parallel cores on a GPU to run neural net models on the edge or on a device. It also helps you optimize your training in the cloud before you push the models down to the edge. And CUDA was extremely performant and it still is. And you've seen, if you follow that trend, you've seen how Apple in the last couple of years has added a neural engine to their SOCs. So at this point, models have become more efficient, commute, compute has gone up and become both power efficient and faster. And for example, the oven, is able to recognize food in 150 to 200 milliseconds. And a second model counts it, which also takes about 100 milliseconds to count. And so this is, it's not real time, but it's near real time for the use case it's being built for. So it's totally possible. Okay. Um, so our next question is, um, would you go back in time and stay with Apple? And um, I might actually reframe this question. Um, maybe you'd like to elaborate on why didn't you stay with Apple? Well, Apple is an amazing company. I was there for about five years um, and then I wanted to try a startup. Yeah, actually, no. So I think to, to answer that, to go back in time, I probably would have still tried something new because the way I saw it was, I was in the Bay Area, um, people were doing startups, like Apple had sort of kickstarted the whole app store and the app economy. So it was an interesting thing to learn and do. And 
it's just an opportunity. See, opportunities live, opportunities are ephemeral, right? Um, they come and go. And for me, there was an opportunity to go work at a startup with someone, one of my coworkers who had, I had worked with and it worked really well with them. And so when that opportunity presented itself, it was worth taking the jump. And, like, and Jackie, like you said, it was an educated guess. Um, or educated risk. Um, and the idea was, well, if this doesn't work, I'll come back to Apple. I'm sure they'll need more people in the future. So this, I've taken risks a couple of times in my life, um, moving from Apple to, actually moving to Apple was a risk because when I was, this is the year 2007, Apple announced the iPhone. It hadn't hit the market. It was the company's first smartphone ever. Nokia, Motorola, Blackberry were kind of the reigning kings of mobile back then. LG was starting to sort of take market share from Motorola, but Nokia was the king. And it just didn't, it was inconceivable that a newcomer will come and make an impact, especially at $629 to buy the phone. And then it only had 3G, had no videos. Anyway, there's, there's a lot of like negative press around the viability of that phone, but it was worth taking the risk. And again, the educated risk was, if this doesn't work out, I'll go back to Motorola. <laughs> so in some ways, you have to take the risks because if it works out, the reward is worth it. If it doesn't work out, you still have the solid foundation. Like everyone here is at Purdue. It's a great, great school. You, you will always have that education that you're getting here as a foundation to fall back on. So I encourage, take the risk. If it doesn't work out, you have something that was working well for you in the past. Okay, I think we have time for one more quick question. Lucas asked, what do you think is the biggest part of the first step of starting a mobile software or app? Learn, learn Swift. That's probably the first step. Uh, all, all jokes aside, I, I feel, Consumers have so many options when it comes to apps and services today. Like the, this is a very different world today than it was 10 or 14 years ago. So I think the first thing that you have to have is clarity on what you're building, um, what problem does it solve, and your solution should be effective and elegant because the tolerance for badly designed software is just not there anymore. So I would say, understand your problem, understand your solution, and make sure it's a nice experience doing it. Okay, um, thank you for the great conversation. And I'll let Dr. Kulkarni have um, the last words. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, Jackie, for being a fantastic interlocutor uh, tonight. Uh, that, was, that was a lot of fun. Uh, Nikhil, that was an amazing session. Um, and I agree with Jackie, that was one of the, the coolest and, and best answers to how to define success that I've heard uh, in my time doing this. So, so thank you very much for that. And uh, I hope all of you that were in attendance will go back and kind of rewatch that and, and maybe internalize some of it. I think it's a really great way to think about the issue. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I really enjoyed this. I, I hope everybody else did too.